So this is going to be the first introductory lecture, micro lecture, for the Western Peace Traditions course. Inevitably, peace always collides with war, and there's a whole history in the West, as in many other cultures, of this tension between war and peace. One of the great novels that most of you probably won't have a chance to read, and yet sums it up in a pretty succinct, compact, thoughtful, and in-depth way is Lev Tolstoy's great novel, War and Peace. Uh, Lev Tolstoy, in War and Peace, not only looks at the external nature of war, and this dealt with in War and Peace, Napoleon's invasion of Russia, but he looks at, so where you have states colliding in War and Peace questions, but he also, as he probes the various characters in War and Peace, the war that goes on within each person as well, where um, the desires collide, uh, relationships collide, people feel betrayed, and so uh, Tolstoy explores what Hopkins would call the inscape, the inner life of a person, or what Plato would talk about, how multiple um, desires or longings can collide and the war that can take place internally, which often psychology will reflect on. Um, spirituality will reflect on, and then the external nature of war as well, where nations collide, states collide, nations collide. And so war and peace uh, is one of those perennial issues that just will not quit or go away in that sense. It's a bit like Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, or Austin's Pride and Prejudice, or Dickens' Tales of Two Cities of Wealth and Poverty. Uh, there are these great themes of the human journey, regardless of culture, time, and place, that are part of the human soul and the human journey as people engage in communities and families and relationships and economics and politics and ecological issues that there is war and yet there is always the longing for peace and so war and peace of the course of western peace traditions will be exploring on the one hand the longing for peace for unity and yet the other hand the collision in terms of people as they interpret peace very very differently uh, throughout time uh, we'll be looking at western peace traditions for the simple reason that we don't just study the past as a museum piece or archival information, but because the women and men of the past have thought deeply and they have acted meaningfully on these issues of war and peace. And so to study how the Jewish tradition thought about it, the difference between nationalist Judaism and prophetic Judaism, how the Greeks thought, thought about it, particularly through the Peloponnesian War, what was Herodotus and Thucydides, how were they trying to make sense of this? What's Plato, particularly in the Republic and the Gorgias and some of his other works, grappling with the clash between wisdom and peace when power and those who just think power and peace is just something that uh, is defined by power or those who have the greatest amount of strength or the military might in that sense. And so we get in the history of um, Western peace traditions, there is the older Jewish tradition uh, in Hebrew, uh, the word for peace, uh, shalom, or in Arabic, shalom, means peace. And so peace is one of these key elements within the Middle Eastern tradition, uh, as it is in the Greek tradition, the same with the Roman tradition itself. And how did these great civilizations, which shaped sub substantive elements of the West, understand the meaning of peace, wisdom, power, when these things collide. And then out of this came the great synthesis of the Christian tradition that you get in the, the, um, the biblical tradition of the New Testament. So the Beatitudes, one of the foundation texts, are a manifesto for peace in that sense that people like Mahatma Gandhi are going to pick up on. He blends it with the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, so the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Lev Tolstoy, who I mentioned earlier in War and Peace, this was a foundation text and Tolstoy did so much to um, encourage, shape the Dukabor movement in Russia, support them. And in fact, it was his funding from his third great novel, Resurrection, that brought the Dukabors to Canada and to British Columbia. And so British Columbia has been one of the centers of, of Dukabor culture, which is a peacemaking culture in many of their communal houses in the interior, Grand Forks, 
Castlegar, one of the three largest statues in the world is of Lev Tolstoy is in Castlegar in British Columbia because the Duke of Orever him as in one sense their saint and Tolstoy's thinking comes out of the Beatitudes Sermon on the Mount of Peacemaking. Blessed are the peacemakers. And so the, the Christ, early Christian tradition uh, brought together the best of the Jewish prophetic tradition, also drew together the wisest elements of the Roman and the Greek tradition. And then when we get to the patristic era of the second to the seventh centuries, you get the great women and men of the early uh, church thinking through the war peace issue. Um, and what do you do and, and what does a, a person do when invading tribes are coming in? Do ones take a pacifist position, i.e. the dove? Uh, the other is the hawkish position, the aggressive nature, for example, the Roman Empire, or what we would fast forward to today. So emerging Chinese Empire, American Empire, many of these empires, which is about power, peace through strength. Uh, what's the role of the owl in all of that? And so when we look at the question of peacemaking, the, the pacifist Dovis position, should that be absolutized? Uh, peace through strength, the hawkish position, or the owl, where does that fit in? And we'll be exploring that in terms of how the Christian tradition had to grapple with the tensions between the dove, the hawk, and the owl, and particularly Augustine is grappling with this. And out of this comes the just war theory, uh, that the Romans, particularly as, as Roman civilization moved from republic to an empire, some of the more thoughtful people were very suspicious of, of sort of peace through strength, peace through power or the Pax Romana, uh, the peace of Rome, which was really a peace based on the power of the Roman military. And so it's like Pax Americana in that sense. The peace of America really hinges on often uh, those uh, states colonized by the states having predictability, but only at the peace, at the, the price of um, uh, American power. Uh, in their in their their states and any sort of uh, reaction dissidence is met very quickly with death squads usually so peace peace strength power wisdom how do these fit in so large elements of the Christian tradition which have shaped the Western tradition largely there is this grappling with war and peace uh, power and wisdom within usually some form of historic context as well uh, as we hit the Reformation, we'll look at the obviously the religious wars that go in one direction, and the other hand, people like Erasmus, for example, is a key figure as uh, in terms of an ironical the owl approach in peacemaking. Uh, as we move through the Western peace traditions, we'll then be looking at how is the West has moved. Um, one sense part of a global journey itself. You encounter other religions, the Chinese tradition, the Indian tradition I mentioned earlier, Gandhi, for example, and the whole decolonization of India was based on a certain dovish approach to how you bring transformation. Uh, and so Latin America, Middle East, obviously very different understandings of, of peace and justice. Uh, can you have peace without justice? What's the relationship of justice without peace? Uh, we'll explore, be exploring some of those dynamics. So we'll, we'll gradually move out of the, the history of Western civilization to look at obviously uh, global cultures, global civilizations, and the quest for peace through big international organizations like League of Nations, uh, historically uh, United Nations today, um, European Union, many regional unions in different parts of the world as well. The the uh, one, one element also that is important to recognize, particularly at universities, as we are thinking through the whole indigenization tradition, uh, one of the, probably she was called the Mohawk Princess. Pauline Johnson spent her last years in Vancouver. Stanley Park was one of her favorite areas to walk, and she often paddled the waters in those uh, particular areas. Uh, Pauline Johnson came from a very significant Mohawk Iroquois family. Her great grandfather, Smokey Johnson, was one of the leading figures when the Mohawk Iroquois fled the United States in 1776. Uh, they came to Canada and they identified with the British because they saw in the United Empire loyalists who left the United States people that would assist them in opposing um, the devastation of their culture by um, increasingly an Americanized culture. And then in the War of 1812, it was Pauline Johnson's um, again, her grandfather uh, that was sided, worked very closely with the British 
uh, in terms of pushing the Americans back across the border so that we wouldn't become a, a star a star in the American flag. In fact, if it hadn't been for 1812 and 1867, uh, John A. Macdonald, we today would really just be um, a star in the American flag and Trump would be our president. So there would be the United States of North America. But because of the War of 1812, Pauline Johnson, very important, as was the Anglican bishop, uh, Bishop John Strawn, they prevented that uh, military war approach and tried to create north of the 49th. A, a different type of country. Uh, now Pauline Johnson and her father went on to become the head of the Six Nations in, in Brantford area and uh, she became probably the one most the uh, animated electrifying lectures on both First Nations cultures in her time. Uh, she knew the history well. She blended the best of the English tradition with the best of the First Nations tradition. And she spent her final years in the Vancouver area. And out of that, she published uh, a little book. She had other books published as well. But her Legends of Vancouver, which will be a textbook for this course, looks at 14 legends or myths, which are foundational in this case to West Coast culture, the Squamish, the Stalo. And um, she tells in these stories many of the myths uh, that were foundational to First Nations understanding of peace and war. Uh, and, and it's attached to, to various places in the lower mainland. And so we'll look at, uh, at some of those stories as well. The first of the stories, most of you who've been in the Vancouver area or driven North Shore Mountains, you'll obviously have seen the lions. And of course, we think of it uh, as the lions. Now, First Nations, and I just mentioned Pauline Johnson, took a lot of these stories from Chief Joe Capilano from the uh, Capilano band, uh, as he was, he often didn't tell these myths or legends to many, but as he came to trust Pauline Johnson, he would tell these ancient stories of the First Nations on the coast. The first story in her collection, Legends of Vancouver, uh, deals with what we call the lions, which is, you can approach it from Cypress Mountain. If a person's interested in climbing them, it's a longer trip, or you can go from Lions Bay, which is a, a quicker trip up. But within, within the First Nations tradition, those two hills or two mountains that spike up, brilliant colors, the sun rises on them and sun sets on them. They, they tower like sentries above the lower mainland. They're called the two sisters in in the lore, the legends of the First Nations or the chief's daughters. <clears throat> and that story itself is a war and peace issue. You had the um, you had various tribes at war on the west coast long before contact. There, of course, this is this um, perhaps. Um, I won't say dishonest, but perhaps an idealized notion of First Nations that before contact, these people worked together closely, uh, harmoniously, close to nature, and bands were were uh, walked arm in arm with one another. And most of the myths Pauline Johnson and Chief Joe Capilano tells, it's a little more complex than that. But this first story in the collection called the Two Sisters or the Chief's Daughters, is about, in fact, the lower mainland tribes. They were, they were putting on a great feast. The two daughters were coming of age when they would enter into some sort of married relationship. And the chief had set aside all sorts of possessions and feasts and potlatches and dancing and bringing the best of, of different bands together in the lower mainland. But they were also at war with, and the story goes, with the band in Prince Rupert, which is the Haida. Um, and so the story begins with war and peace. It's essentially bands at war in one another. And uh, so for weeks, this preparation for the feast goes on. Meanwhile, the war canoes are coming down from Prince Rupert or was called Queen Charlotte's, which is now Haida Gwaii. And you had the tribes of peace. So the daughters came to their father, the chief, and they said, could we make a request of you? Uh, and he said, anything as you as you as you move from this next season of your life, what what would you desire uh, that I can give you as the chief of these these uh, bands in the lower mainland? And they said, we have one request for you, Father, uh, is that the feast you will put on, you will invite the Haida, 
down and you will bring them to the feast and ask them to join us and 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 put aside their war their war their arms and the the battle that has been going on between the Haida and our peoples to the south uh, and so uh, this would be our request to you father is that the wars cease and that they will be invited to these great pot pot latches and um uh, Hopefully, as a result of this, the animosity which has existed and the deaths which have occurred um, will come to an end by everyone coming together for a period of time and sharing what they own uh, for our coming of age or our coming out, as it were, in that sense. And so the father heeded their request heeded their request. He sent a message to the war canoes, the Haida, as they were coming and say, uh, let us put away our, our fighting material and we would like you to join us for this great festival that will last for weeks, a festival of unity, a festival of peace. And this is what my daughters have requested as a result of their next stage and next season of their unfolding journey. Uh, and as a result of that, the war that existed between the Haida, the Capilano and other groups at the lower mainland ended. And so these two hills, which we call mountain peaks in that sense, the lions for First Nations, it's always a memory standing up there, uh, a peace symbol over Vancouver saying there were two women, the two daughters or the two sisters or the chief's daughters that rather than um, only thinking of themselves and being pampered and petted as they were coming of age. They thought bigger. They thought peace between warring tribes and what could be done to end the animosity, the conflict. And so these two two hills, two mountains, rock knobs that stick up uh, that cannot be missed are meant to be portals reminding those uh, within Vancouver uh, that where there is war, there is always another option, and that is peacemaking itself. And so in the First Nations culture, which we'll be also looking at as we go through the 14 legends in uh, Legends of Vancouver, that Pauline Johnson, not only are they tales from Chief Joe Capilano, but a variety of other people, and, and, and how markings, landmarks themselves, like Sh Siwash Walk around Stanley Park, that's another key area which we'll get into uh, in, again tensions, clashes, overcoming them, how is this done? And so when we look at Western peace traditions, not only would we be looking at the history of the classical West of, of the Jewish tradition, the Greek tradition, the Roman tradition, the Christian tradition, which synthesized much of this, will be branching out to global uh, cultures in terms of their war, peacemaking traditions, but we'll also be threading through all of this First Nations myths and legends as well when it comes to war and peace and the directions that people can take, whether they're concerned with power itself and control, or is it about peacemaking and overcoming animosity and conflict. So that'll be a general overview of the course that we're going to cover. And hopefully by the end, we'll have a greater sense of the difference between the challenges and tensions of being the dove or absolute pacifism the challenges of the hawk and then sort of a, an aggressive uh, peace through strength and the role of the owl. Of course, the owl is always the symbol of wisdom. So how does wisdom find its way between absolute pacifism and a very hawkish approach in which peace only exists as a result of those who are the strongest? And so that will be the general overview for this course.